Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Ten Thousand Roads to Financial Independence. Today I have Jerome Myers with me. Jerome Myers is the pre preeminent authority of、uh, dream realization, a believer that dreams can and should be real. Jerome left the corporation America when he realized that his role offered financial gain but little significance. He is the founder and head coach of Myers Methods and has been featured in Black、uh, Enterprise Magazine. Um, Business Insider has numerous podcasts, numerous like up to two hundred fifty episodes.、Uh, Jerome and his firms can guide any individuals from a、um, boring, inspired existence to a life of fulfillment and impact. We're happy to have you on the show today, Jerome. Elisa, thank you so much for having me. It is so meditating to like listen to your voice. I want to comment on that. Um, you know, just by talking to him, I feel like my Zen is being returning.、Um, and so, Jerome, like you have a very interesting story.、Um, we always ask our podcast show、um, guests. The first question we ask them is always like thinking back、uh, in your life, who kind of helped you,、uh, who has the most impact in shaping the entrepreneur who you are today. If you can kind of give us a little bit insight into that mindset, how that be informed, that be great. Yeah, you know, I've never been asked that question, so I was a little taken aback as you were asking it because, like, well, what do I say here? Because I need an entrepreneur in order to say this, right? But I think the true answer is I don't. And so, my dad, right? My dad always wanted to be an entrepreneur. He never actually was. So he joined the Marines when he was sixteen, got out after four years and doing the extraction from Vietnam. He went back into the military. He joined the army when he was however old, and him and my mom ended up getting married. And he went through the military career, got out of the military, drove trucks for Schneider, and then my mom said, "Hey, this boy is getting wild. You need to come back home." So he came <laughs> back and started working for the post office. And today he still works for the post office, right? And I still remember my dad wanted to start this side business. It was a waterless car wash system. It was called Squirt the Dirt. Right,、wow. and so he would come in and he'd spray this thing on a rag and he rub it on the car and the car would start to shine,、mm. and that was my dad being an entrepreneur. That was what he thought he could do with his stance in life, right, and or state in life. My mom grew up the daughter of a sharecropper. They were really, really, really poor,、mm -hmm. and what was most important to her. Was steady and stable income,、mm -hmm. and my dad's brother was a truck driver,、yeah. and he owned his own rig, and you know he would work when he wanted to work and not work when he didn't want to work. And there were times where his brother would say, "Hey, can I borrow some money because I didn't work enough in order to cover all the things?"、Mm -hmm. And so my mom saw that and said she never wanted to be in a place where they had to borrow money. Right. And so my dad never actually went down a path because、mm -hmm. I think the majority of us who ever go into corporate America or civil service, we get addicted to the paycheck,、mm -hmm. right? We get addicted to knowing that on, every two weeks or on the first or on the fifteenth or the thirtieth, whatever your payday is,、right. that that money is going to hit the bank.、Yeah. And what I learned <laughs> through going through corporate America in my last role, I built the. Division of a Fortune 550 to 20 million dollars and about 170 employees was that that was a total illusion and I saw it first in 2009 but I didn't actually have to tell anybody that they weren't going to have a place of employment anymore、mm -hmm. but you know after building a pretty profitable business it was 30 percent profitable each year、mm -hmm. we were still laying people off yeah and. For the life of me, I, I didn't actually get it, and so what I did know was that it's all an illusion,、mm -hmm. right? The thought that you are going to get your paycheck two weeks from now is only because you worked two weeks in the hole、mm -hmm. when you got started, right? Got it. And so you know, you start going down this path of thinking, oh yeah, well I'm in good shape. Well, you may not get a severance package depending on the company that you work for.、Right. You. Maybe told, hey, we don't like what you're doing here, and if you're in an at-will state, that's the end of your employment. Yeah. And so, when I decided that I was going to exit corporate America,、yeah. that was one of the main things that came to mind. Is at any given day, the guy that I report to can come in and say, "We don't have a space for you anymore."、Mm 
Mm-hmm. There's no fun in that. And so I decided that I'd rather the buck stop with me mm-hmm. and I, you know, go off on this journey of building a business of my own. Yeah. So, and then it sounds like your previous W2 position, if you don't mind us asking, what industry were you working in? And it sounds like you were like the maybe pretty high up in terms of managers and et cetera. So, you know, the more people kind of build that wealth from illusion of wealth from the W2 job, the harder it is to kind of leave. Um, so how long did you uh, come up with that mindset of like, hey, I need to leave or come to peace with it, essentially? Um, and, uh, you know, like, is there any fear behind it? How do you kind of overcome it? Okay, so I think you asked three questions. I'm going to try to get all of them without asking you to repeat any of them. So first, after the first year, when I had to let people know that they weren't going to have opportunity to work with us anymore. I promised myself that I would never do that again. Right. And so that was the beginning of the end for me because I didn't want to be in a space where I was telling somebody else that they made me do it. Mm. Right. It wasn't my choice anymore. Um, I was in the power industry. We were taking overhead power lines, putting them underground. And my division was responsible for the engineering, real estate procurement, and construction of that, mm-hmm. right? And so, yeah, I, the p and I have P&L responsibility, which, you know, for your listeners, I think is actually puts people in the actual hierarchy of things because most people don't ever actually manage the budget or the P&L. Mm-hmm. And I reported to a senior vice president who reported to a president who reported to the CEO. So you know, three layers down from the CEO of the company. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And then so how, like, is there a fear kind of when you leave the job? Because you already made your mind mindset up. You already made your mind up that you're going to leave. Does that help in terms of helping you kind of make that jump? Uh, because the more income you have, kind of like the more that you got to have to think about replacing. Yeah, yeah I mean, So, you know, part of the the body of knowledge that we've created is a 15 point checklist that helps people assess their readiness to exit the matrix is what we call it. Matrix readiness assessment. Right. And so, you know, the more money you make. That part doesn't matter because everybody who wants to leave. So, oh, I got to replace my income with my side business before I can leave. You don't need to replace your income with your side business. You need to cover your expenses with your side business right or you need to have enough money and savings to cover your expenses so that you can work on the business Mm full-time while not making the income that you used to make Mm -hmm. all of these things are solutions to the problem Mm -hmm. if you know for a fact that you don't want to be dependent or addicted to the paycheck anymore yeah that's amazing so you mentioned about this 15 checkpoint list of where can people grab them or like how do they get their hands on them yeah so you know we're probably not to that point of the show but at jeromemyers.co you can just register to get that 15 point checklist and it it gives you all the things right i can give probably two or three of them right now and you know the first one is just having a year's worth of expenses and savings Mm -hmm. um the second is have you had a conversation with everybody who's going to be impacted by your decision Mm -hmm. and just understand what their concerns are so you can address those and maybe the third one that's worth mentioning is just making sure that you have gotten everything that you need on credit already done, Mm -hmm. right? The first few years that you're out, they're going to be looking at your tax returns when they're making credit decisions Mm -hmm. uh, because you don't have, you know, a a W-2 or something that you can show them, hey, I'm going to, or a pay stub, you can show, hey, I'm going to make money. Mm -hmm. And honestly, you're probably going to make less money than you did before. So, you want to make sure that everything that you're going to borrow for that's major, like if you're doing a house or something like that, you get that taken care of beforehand because banks really like W-2s. Yes, they do. <laughs> the whole system is right to make sure that you stay at your job. Um, and so, you know, kind of fast forward, you left your corporation job. But it sounds like you just kind of plunge in head first um, versus some of our other guests maybe doing this like ease off transitioning. Um, and, uh, so, you know, what industry, did you know what industry you're going to get into right off the bat before you left your post? Um, if not, you know, how did you kind of come up with, um, that idea? 
Yeah, so I I did parachute with Dada Parachute. I didn't have a proven business model. And, you know, that's one of the things on a proven checklist or the 15 point checklist is, you know, sell something and know that you can sell it again, right? Because you've got to sell in order to be an entrepreneur. But I did anecdotally know what I was going to do, right? So when I was in college, me and my buddy Duran were sitting on the stoop. And I realized that I was paying three ninety five. I had two roommates doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. He lived downstairs, and they were doing the exact same thing downstairs. Mm-hmm. When we multiplied it out across the complex, the guy was making seven hundred thousand dollars a year. We never saw him. We never talked to him. Right. This is amazing. Yeah. Right. And I, I, maybe I don't need seven hundred thousand. What if I had seventy? Yeah. Right. And so we're going through it, and you're like, well, how do you do it? And like I said, my dad was in the military. My mom stayed home with me. Yeah. Multi-million dollar real estate owners were not coming to hang out at our house. No. Right. So I, I didn't know anybody that done this. And because we never saw the guy or talked to him, we couldn't go ask, hey, how'd you do this? Yeah. So that's why we went off in the corporate America. But I decided when I was going to leave, hey, let me go get that dream off the shelf. And, right. you know, now that I've got some business experience, I got some credentials and got some net worth and a credit score, maybe I can go to the bank and just go buy it, right? That's what we do. We just go buy real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't work out, but that's what I thought I was going to do. Yeah. How? So um, what part of that didn't work out and what it ta- what did it taught you um, in terms of uh, helping you for the next venture? Yeah, 1000%. I went to 10 banks and they all told me no. They weren't going to give me a million dollar loan to buy this 23 unit building. Every yeah. single one of them. They told me I didn't have the requisite experience to be successful at it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? I got an MBA and I just ran this $20 million business and I, I got all these things, right? PMP certifications, engineering license. Like, wh- what do you want? We want you to have signed a loan doing this business plan and showing us that you could do it successfully. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have any of those things. <laughs> like, and that's why we're not going to give you money. Yeah. And so I pivoted and started fixing and flipping. And then eventually we got back into the space, Mm -hmm. but I had to do what I could do in the time. And, you know, the thing with fix and flip is all your money's going the wrong way, right? There is no income because it's a dead asset. And then you hope to get a big payday at the end of it. And I I just didn't enjoy that, Mm -hmm. but it was great experience for me, especially Mm -hmm. since the majority of what we do is value add on our multifamily properties today. Yeah. Yeah, the constructions and it that kind of give you a little bit more construction backgrounds and et cetera too. Um, so for our fix and flip out there, um, can you kind of explain that all your money is kind of going the wrong way? I love simplified. You're summarizing that, um, but also like some of the tax implications as well uh, with that fix and flip. Like why did you not enjoy doing the fix and flip? Because there's a lot of action that's involved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I still remember driving to the property at five o'clock one morning because I was going to do my own landscaping. I was going to get all of the grass out of the flower bed and get the plants in the ground. And I wanted to do it before it got terribly hot because summers in Virginia are pretty unbearable, especially if you're in, you know, the May, June, July timeframe. So I thought to myself as I was crossing over the bridge, I'm working harder now than I did when I had a job. Mm -hmm. And I'm making less. In fact, I'm not making anything. Yeah. I'm writing checks to contractors and I'm not putting any money in my pocket. Mm-hmm. This is stupid. It's, there was no other way for me to characterize it. Yeah. And yeah, you're busy and maybe that feels good, but it's about being productive. Yes. And it's about creating wealth. It's not about anything else from my perspective when you're trading your time for money. Yeah. So um, transition back into the multifamily because you got told that no once. Now, thinking back that knowing what you know now, would you advise to yourself that, you know, at the time when you buy the 23 unit, what would you advise to that person to get it done as the first deal? Because first deal is always like the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Have somebody look over your shoulder who knows what they're doing. Yeah. Right. I, I did it the most inefficient and effective way. School mm-hmm. of hard knocks. I'm going to figure it out. And so, you know, a lot of real estate investors go to the bigger pockets community and they say, oh, yeah, you can just go take action and it'll all work out. That's stupid. <laughs> right. Like if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Just taking action is 
always going to cost you more money and waste more time than spending some time and money with a person who can actually help you get through that process. Mm -hmm. Right. Most people don't actually have the capacity. And I hate that we disrespect real estate operators the way that we do. Mm -hmm. If I was opening a plumbing company, I would go to the community college and get the education requisite to actually be successful as a plumbing contractor. Right. I'm not just going to go hang my shingle as, you know, Myers plumbing <laughs> and start fixing sinks. Cause guess what? They're all going to leak. If I do it, they're all going to leak. There's no question about it. Right. And you know, it can't be that hard. Right. Just go to Lowe's, get the parts, put them in. Yeah. No, there is so much other stuff that goes into it. And if you think that, you know, real estate is any easier when you're dealing with somebody's home, I think you're sadly mistaken. Well, I don't think I know you are. Yeah. Right. And so paying somebody to help you get up the learning curve because there is a learning curve mm -hmm. and going through that will make your business way bigger than you will ever be able to build it on your own. And I know that for a fact, my business would probably be three to five times bigger than what it is today had I actually spent the time and money in the right program with the right people helping me move along the path. But instead I, I try to figure it all out from the beginning. I mean, to case in point, trying to go to the bank and get a loan that's a million dollars right. when you don't have any experience doing the thing mm -hmm. is laughable. I don't even know why they talk to me. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, to be clear, they were right. Like that first deal, had I gotten that loan, yeah, I would have went bankrupt. Yeah, because I underestimated the construction cost. I underestimated the time it was going to take to get the project done. There were things that happened that I didn't expect to happen. Right. And it was all because you know I was I knew what I was doing. I was just going to take action. That right. no, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, because what you're doing for wealth is going to turn into a debt. Right. Right. And that's going to crush you. And then there's more, many years to kind of climb me out of it. Um, so this time you did it right. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your how you transition into your first multifamily deal? Like, how did that whole I, I don't know how long it take you to do a first deal in multifamily, but how kind of how long did that uh, basically the whole process of um, ramping up to that? Yeah, yeah, it took a little less than a year. I still bought the same property. <laughs> but what happened was I was sitting on the stoop of uh, 1920s rehab that was about 2,000 square feet. We bought it for like $40,000 and we put $90,000 in that property. And, you know, we we knew that we hit a home run. And so a guy pulls up in his white Dodge Ram, hops out. He's like, hey, bud, let me check out your property. We're getting ready to do one down the street. It's like, yeah. man, you want to see my property? Yeah. You want to see mine? Yeah, come on in, man. Let me show you. And he's like, walked in. He's man, you took that wall out and you did the granite and, oh, you put the sink in the island with the gooseneck? Like that, that's really appealing. And then he walks through the doors and he looks at the French time period accurate doors because it was built in 1920s, right? So the doors were smaller. And he goes upstairs and he looks in the bathroom. He's like, man, I really like this tile. So he's coming back down the stairs. He's getting ready to walk out the front door and he pauses in the threshold and he looks back and he says, hey, you know anything about that 23 unit building behind the Chimbo Mart? It's like, yeah, I tried to buy it. I said, well, I'm going to make an offer on that later in the day. I said, really? Yeah. You're the guy I've been looking for. See, the people at the bank told me that I needed somebody with experience. You have experience if you're going to make an offer, right? He's yeah. like, yeah, we bought some stuff. And so I look at him and was like, please don't leave me out the deal. Like, why would you? Why would you leave me? You can't leave me out the deal. Like you're the guy I've been looking for. He's like, what are you going to bring to the table? Yeah. Uh, we, we'll figure that out. Just don't leave me out. Like this is the deal I want to do. And you're the experienced person that I needed to meet. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but what are you going to bring to the table? I yeah. said, man, listen, we'll figure it out. Like, just don't leave me out of the deal. And so he kind of shakes his head, walks down the stairs, walks through the grass, hops in his truck and drives off. Yeah. And I'm sitting there like, oh, yeah, it's happening now. <laughs> yeah. Right. And this was on a Wednesday. And so Friday comes and goes, no call. I was like, OK, he'll call me Monday. Maybe they just didn't accept it yet. Yeah. Monday happened, nothing. Friday of the next week comes by, still no phone call, still no nothing. Yeah. And then on the Tuesday of the next week, I get a call from a guy I used to lend money to who was fixing a flipping prior to me getting out of corporate. Mm -hmm. And 
he was like, hey, I just got an opportunity to be a general contractor on that property we were talking about back in January, February. He said, but I told them that I would only be comfortable doing the deal if you were involved. Yeah. I was like, whew. So now we're back in the game. Yeah. And so I eventually was the asset manager on that project. And because I was in that role, the reporter called because they were doing a big press release on it and asked if I had any input or feedback to go into the story. Yeah. And he included my feedback. And I'll never forget when the article came out, it says, uh, you know, rising star partners with proven real estate investors to rehab Churchill townhomes. Yeah. I was like, man, this is a good article. Who's this about? <laughs> hey, and I kept reading and then I saw my name and I was like, oh. And then what happened after that is other people saw my name, particularly people who worked at banks. Yeah. So they started calling and asking, you know, how we decided who we were going to refinance with. And, you know, did I have other projects in my pipeline? I had one project. I didn't know what a pipeline was. Right. Yeah. And they wanted to know if I wanted to go to lunch so I could see their products. And I was like, yeah, of course I want to go to lunch. I, everybody's <laughs> calling me. I want to talk. So we, we made some relationships there and then we took that a little further south. And so I left Richmond, Virginia, where that first deal was. And we came to Greensboro, North Carolina. We were building our portfolio here. That's fantastic. Greensboro is uh, one of my favorite markets. We're not in there, obviously, because it's really far from Seattle, uh, but it's one of our favorite markets uh, for sure that we share with our students, et cetera, on too. That's awesome. So, um, so you got the 24 units. Well, 23 units, which is fantastic. Finally, that it all comes around full circle. Um, and uh, so building rapport is very important to kind of just summarize it for our viewers over here. Um, then what did you do then, you know, to kind of scale to where you are today? Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the additional growth after your first projects now owning whatever you own over there? Um, you know, what did it took additional learning you learned from scaling up? Um, yeah, I think the most important thing is make sure that you hire the right property manager to execute the business plan that you've created. I think most people who are entrepreneurs are willing to take on whatever until they learn that taking on whatever doesn't actually pay well. Right. And so we hire people who we shouldn't have hired to try to implement and execute our business plans. Mm -hmm. And that had created some issues for us early on. So I think that's the most important lesson. And, you know, if you're a part of a RIA and your president isn't using that property manager, then there's probably a reason that they're not being used, right? Yes. And that's what happened with me in that situation. Cause I thought, okay, just engage in a real estate investor association and, you know, I'll meet great people and they'll all take care of me. And yeah. I just didn't find that to actually be the case. Um, yeah. And so, you know, as far as scaling and deal flow, we met with brokers who specialize on the property type that we were looking for, which we buy C class properties and B areas. Mm -hmm. And we, and deal size is anything less than a hundred and greater than 10, because we think that it's a niche that most people aren't pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we do is we get direct to seller. And so, you know, we, we send letters, we make phone calls, we network, all with the intention of helping those folks who are close to retirement get ready to get unlock their equity, right? I think it's a lot of folks who have bought real estate, maybe it doesn't cash flow all that well, and they have their money tied up in it. And at some point, there's always this interest in bringing that cash out and being able to live the lifestyle that they truly desire to have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So really kind of carves out the niche. I was just going to ask in this competitive landscape in Greensboro, um, we all know it's very difficult to find any deal established in a market. So do you have any advice to our listener on, you know, how do you actually work up that pipeline? Um, so then pipeline means you have many deals uh, lining up for that. Um, but uh, and uh, so how do you actually kind of build up at that pipeline in any given market? Um, really, uh, do you have some tips to kind of share with our listener on that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is you got to know what you're looking for. I hear people say they're buying North Carolina. Well, how can you buy the whole state of North Carolina? 
right? <laughs> yes. Like, it, it just doesn't make sense, right? It, and even within a city, like, they're buying everything. Like, what are you actually looking for? And then you can go find it. You have to define what you want. And I think this is where people get in the most trouble early on in their real estate investing career because they're like, oh, I'm just looking for any and everything. But how is that beneficial for you? And how can you actually craft a message that's going to cut through all of the noise and all your competitors to have the person who has the ownership of the property select you as a person who they're going to sell the property to? Right. And I can promise you it's not always based on price. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, what is it based on in your opinion? Like what does a seller look for? I think a lot of sellers want to do certainty of clothes, mm -hmm. right? There is nothing fun about going under contract. And then three months later, six months later, you find out that you're not actually going to get the payday that you were counting on. Mm -hmm. and so you still have to deal with the property. Yeah. So I think the first thing and most important thing is your ability to convey certainty to the seller that you're going to buy the property if they go under contract with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and how do you convey that? <laughs> well, I think it's one having a command of this knowledge or a command of the space, right? Yeah. So if you know what's traded in the market, if you know what your actual business plan is and you can communicate those effectively to the person, mm -hmm. then they're not going to see you as an amateur, even if you are an amateur. Right. Multifamily investing has its own vernacular. Right. There are vocabulary terms in our course. We, we talk about 82 different vocabulary words that most people don't actually know unless yeah. they've been in multifamily investing. And so, you know, if you're not using those in your conversations with folks, not to show them how smart you are, but mm -hmm. to show them that you actually do the business mm -hmm. and you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing all these knowledges. Um, and you mentioned about hiring. Um, as you kind of like you expand, what is your five year, 10 year goal? Like what kind of really drives you um, in terms of your next stage or what do you kind of see your next stage of? Business? Yeah, I mean, just at the highest level, we've got a goal of having a thousand door portfolio by the end of 2028. And that's kind of how we created the mission back in 2018 when we realized that we had a repeatable process and we wanted to set our sights on something bigger than, hey, I just did my next deal. Yeah. I um, mean, we'll do that through a combination of acquiring existing assets and building new. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And uh, so a thousand units, that's kind of where, and then my understanding, you guys have a pretty big ownership on these two. Um, so tell us a little bit about your, uh, do you, you syndicate, right? Like it, how's your ownership we do not. structure kind of works. So, yeah, um, so we're not syndicators. We do joint venture deals as a general practice. And so, you know, we don't have limited partners. It's the people who right. are partners in the deal, bring the cash and we do this, bring the sweat and everybody's expected to be active in some capacity. Yeah, that's awesome. So a very different kind of um, model, uh, per se. It's basically joint ownerships. Everybody is kind of learning. And, and does your student kind of do some deals with you too? Um, tell us a little bit more about your, um, your education program. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got an 11 week course that we do a combination of, you know, live teaching or people can do self study at their own pace. And yeah, I mean, if somebody's got an amazing deal, then we'll do deals. But, you know, if not, then we're very content with just building our portfolio in Greensboro, North Carolina. Yeah. The program goes through our four step process, find, fun, fix and flip. Right. And we believe that every deal goes through that. And I didn't actually come up with it. One of my partners did. Yeah. And he was like, look, we're using the Myers methods. Right. Find, fun, fix, flip. And flip doesn't mean you flip it like a single family home. You can refinance it. But the whole goal for us, whenever you refi, is that you get all of your money out. We don't like partial refis. We want to get people back their original investment so that they can roll it to the new deal. Mm -hmm. um, we put some um, mindset stuff in on the front end mm -hmm. because this is 80, maybe even 90% mindset. 
Yeah. And then we teach the multifamily operations piece. And I mean, we, we literally go through everything from putting your business plan together to what you should be looking for in your asset management and property management contracts to yeah. what you should have in your operating agreement and on through to, you know, what type of things should you be asking your brokers when you're, you know, getting financing on the way in and how you're going to structure it on the way out when you're getting ready to sell. Mm -hmm. So this here is what I wish I would have had when I was getting started, which is, you know, a comprehensive set of data to build your business off of. And then you augment and supplement with your continuing education through the podcasts and YouTube videos and conferences that I think everybody should be going to if they're serious about the business. Yeah. What I've learned is that if you don't have that foundational, that base knowledge, mm -hmm. and you're listening to the person from the Pacific Northwest and mm -hmm. down in Southern California and somebody in the Midwest and the Southeast and the Northeast, that stuff doesn't actually connect. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you need that foundational knowledge so that you can build upon it. Mm -hmm. If not, you'll have these knowledge gaps. I call it being unconsciously incompetent. Mm -hmm. Right. And that usually means that somebody's overconfident. Like, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to do the thing. <laughs> but you've got all these gaps in your plan. And yeah. somebody who's seasoned can see all of it. But, you know, you only know what you know. Yeah. Right. And so you, you get jammed up and get in a space where it's like, oh, well, what am I going to do or how can I do that? And, you know, figuring it out by going through the process yeah, doesn't actually lead to great outcomes usually. Yeah, yeah. That kind of goes back to the, the first version of Jerome when he was doing uh, his 23-unit deal. <laughs> um, yeah. You want to be the second version of Jerome when he's doing his 23-unit deal. Um, and so... The other question I'd like to kind of explore a little bit more too, you have comments um, or so, you know, you're pretty vocal in terms of it being a minority in this space. Um, so I want to get, get a little bit comfortable or uncomfortable here. Um, so do you really see there's a difference in terms of race gaps um, in this industry of work? Um, you know, and, the, you know, what you think could actually be the improvement our listener could potentially do to kind of bridge that gap. Yeah, I might have misheard, but hopefully you said gender too, right? Because I mean, there's but so many ladies that are in the business, right, and sharing their story. So um, I always challenge people, if you're listening to this podcast, and you're having success, and you're not sharing it with anybody, you're selfish, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because, you know, you don't want anybody to know what you have or this, that or the third. Yeah, that's the worst thing you can absolutely do. Because, you know, multifamily investors don't look a certain way. But if you only consume content on certain platforms, you will feel that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's part of our mission as, you know, guests and platform builders to make sure that we are sharing the stories of a diverse mm -hmm. set of people. Right. right. If we always go to the same people who have big brands and, oh, by the way, the majority of them aren't going to share on their platforms because they're not going to build your platform newbie. Right. Then we just further a narrative that isn't true. Right. Right. There are people from all nationalities, all genders doing this business. And it's up to us as content creators to share those stories and share them well. And it's up for people to the people who are in the audience who are applying and implementing to raise their hand and say, I want to share my story because little Jerome may be listening to this podcast and questioning whether or not he can do this. Yeah. And I want little Jerome to know, and this is part of the reason why we built the course because we didn't have a bridge to get the knowledge because we didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if I had that course and a bridge to a community of folks, who were doing the business, who had similar values to what I had, then we would have had more success earlier. And my only reason for coming on these things, because I don't actually enjoy this piece of the business, right? I much rather just be working in my business than going yeah. around and talking about myself, right? I, yeah. Just not that vain. But if I don't share my story, 
then I'm just as big as a part of the problem as everybody else. I remember when I was in corporate America and as an engineer early on, there were 17,000 employees at my company. We had one African-American executive. And I would tell Craig all the time, man, you're the light. Like you make me believe that it's possible for me to actually be an executive here. Mm -hmm. And he would always shrug his shoulders like, Jerome, it's not that big of a deal. Just keep doing a good job and everything will be okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, for me, you know, <laughs> there's a Sesame Street song that says one of these things don't belong, right? And right. it was triangles and they were all the same color. And then there was a square and it was a different color. And it's like, okay, yeah. which one of these things don't belong? And yeah. it was the one that wasn't like all the others. Right. And so we've got to create more stories and we've got creation of the stories as people actually having the success and yeah. the people who've had the success have to share the story so the people who are thinking about it can actually have some motivation and inspiration to know that it's possible for them right kind of being a role model for the next person um funny enough uh my son's name is jerome too so little jerome You're such a smart lady <laughs> okay. See, this is brilliant yeah uh, so i love that um and so jerome let me ask you one more last question and that's kind of usually when we wrap up our show um is um do, do you have children do you have kids i do two girls awesome um and so what are you teaching them today what are you doing to kind of help them to become financial literate um as they kind of growing up and and being confident you know yeah, I think the timing of this question is amazing. So recently, like in the past two weeks, they got their own bank accounts, no. right? And so they have their own cards. And so now it's not daddy to the wallet. They have their own money that they have to learn how to manage and deal with. Sure. Um, and then I think something that's a bigger concept that's probably more meaningful is they've realized that you don't have to trade your time for money, yeah. right? And so Leah, who's my youngest, she was like, so daddy, we buy apartments so that we don't have to go get jobs because the people live in the apartments and they pay us for the use of the apartment. Yeah. Yes, honey. That's exactly why we buy apartments. And she said, so when we go to college, then we're going to buy an apartment and we're going to tell all our friends to come live at the apartment and they're going to pay us. And then we don't have to work at night and stuff. I was like, yes, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, she's amazing because she wants to be an attorney, right? And right. then, you know, the older one, she's she's very much a manager of the resources. And you know, Monopoly is actually one of her favorite games. And so it's yeah. really interesting to watch her connect the dots and see how doing this one thing, for instance, she buys everything. Doesn't matter what it is, she's going to buy it. And so when she ends up being cash poor and something comes up at her property, she can't fix it. Yeah. And so she's looking at me like, I thought you just buy all the things. And I'm like, no, you actually got to make sure that you stay liquid so that you can take yeah. care of things as they come up. And so, you know, we're, we're having all these anecdotal experiences that I think for a lot of folks would seem pretty meaningless, but they're putting the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're playing this really cool game called Animal Crossings. Uh -huh. And it's probably very akin to SimCity, if anybody remembers that. Uh -huh. And so they're, you know, buying things and farming so that they have money. And it's they're taking out mortgages and building rooms on their houses. And it's yeah. one of the, like, coolest games that I've ever seen for a kid. Uh -huh. And, I mean, they're just totally hooked on it and just building a, a world that, you know, started out with basically nothing right yeah and then kind of learning this uh in the more virtual world before I take it to the real one that's awesome well this has been a super awesome conversation with you jerome and how is the uh how does other folks kind of find about your program about your projects um how do they contact you yeah, I try to keep everything simple. So hop over to JeromeMyers.co and you can find out all the things that we have going on. That's awesome. Well, we're going to put that in the show notes. It's such a great um, meeting with you, Jerome, today and a great visit. Um, and uh, this wraps up another episode of 10,000 Roads Financial Independence. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you so much, Jerome, for your time. Thank you, Elisa. <laughs>